Hey, government students. Today we're going to talk about the Supreme Court, how it operates, and barriers to get there. So let's go ahead and take a look. So as you remember, the Supreme Court does not handle most cases. Most cases are held, um, in, as far as federal law goes, by the district courts. Um, so most trials that you would think of would start there. Uh, and then if they are granted an appeal, they go to the U.S. Court of Appeals. And then finally, that's to apply to the Supreme Court, like we've talked about before. Um, and they file a writ of certiorari. And if the Supreme Court grants it, then they will hear the case. Um, but most of them stop somewhere lower in the, uh, the process, as you see here. Um, remember, they can also take up state law cases um, if the state law particularly breaks um, something uh, in the Constitution. For instance, if they, the state infringes upon someone's free speech, it could be taken up then by uh, the Supreme Court. That's the only real cases that they deal with uh, are ones that deal with constitutional questions. All right, so let's break it down. So first, um, here are... Uh, some uh, uh, geographic boundaries that you can see here. This is where um, the District Court of Appeals are. Um, and we're going to go through this a little bit and more in just a minute. But basically, um, this is where, if you remember, this is the second step in the process. This is where um, you would um, see one court in each one of those geographic zones, as you see there. Uh, and so uh, whether you're from North Carolina or South Carolina, if you go to appeal, you're going to go to uh, the fourth District Court of Appeals, which is in, I believe, Virginia currently. Um, and same applies to um, any of the ones that you see there in the different zones. Um, but all of these different zones or District Court of Appeals can go to uh, the Supreme Court. Notice it also includes territories such as uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, etc. All right, so the first step in the process is going to the District Court. Um, there are, I believe, 93 uh, different district courts. Um, and if, as you know, there's 50 different states, and this also includes territories that like we mentioned. Um, so it includes um, every state or territory has at least one district court. Um, notice South Carolina only has one, but larger states in terms of population, such as uh, North Carolina, um, have multiple. Um, it's no set requirement. It's up to the, the courts to decide um, and how many um, are located in each state. Um, additionally, they only really handle original jurisdiction cases. This means that um, if you remember, they're only the cases that get brought up for the first time. So if someone were to break a federal law, these are where most of the trials are held is in the district court. Um, these are what oftentimes gets called the trial court. So if you went on the NAC trip, um, previously, earlier in the year, this would have been the equivalent to what you saw. Uh, it would have been the actual trial, the first place it was heard, the original jurisdiction. Their caseload is very large, and as you learned um, previously, most cases um, don't actually reach court. Um, they are handled mostly um, you know, out of court, and they settle most of those cases. Um, the Judges in charge um, are federal judges. They go through the same process that Supreme Court justices do in being appointed by the president and, uh, you know, confirmed by the Senate. Additionally, there are uh, what they call magistrates. Um, these guys are ones that would basically take most of the smaller cases, the ones that are pretty clear cut um, and handle the easier cases, you might say. Um, and additionally, uh, they would have um, jurisdiction to hear most of those. But then the federal judges hear the larger or more important, you may say, cases, um, higher profile, things that may end up later on in the Supreme Court. They're the ones that would take up those. So the magistrates kind of help alleviate, again, the workload because their caseload is so high in the district court. Um, and it's also key to note that to be um, an attorney at the federal level, you have to pass an additional certification um, in addition to being certified in the state of South Carolina for state laws, you have to pass an additional um, requirements exam for um, being a U.S. attorney. Now, a U.S. attorney usually refers to any attorney that practices federal law, 
um, and there are two types. One um, that is basically the uh, federal court. Um, let's say the U.S. obviously um, may, if um, they break a federal law, would bring the lawsuit against the criminal. Uh, and so you'd have a U.S. federal attorney to prosecute them. Um, additionally, um, you would have U.S. attorneys that would be defense lawyers at the defense. Um, they also have to pass and understand uh, the federal law process. Uh, so when you go to an appeals court, if you notice um, from our previous slide, I'll show you again real quick, um, each one of these different district courts would report to uh, the Fourth Circuit, which is in Virginia, uh, for an appeals court. So again, remember the grounds for an appeals court um, is that um, you would have to have show gross negligence in terms of a bad legal mistake, um, you had incompetent counsel, um, you had um, a situation where evidence was withheld that could have swayed um, how the, the case would have been um, handled. Um, so it's got to be pretty specific in terms of the reasons for appeal, but they're still pretty vague and therefore it leaves it pretty open to interpretation if you want the appeal. Now remember each stage in the process it costs more and more money. Uh, to keep this because lawyers cost money, trials cost money, uh, and so you have to really question whether it's worth your time. Uh, and obviously your wallet bank account is going to suffer as well. Um, so in the appellate procedures, um, you would go through a similar process. However, there is not um, a normal jury trial. This would be held by the appeals court, uh, and these judges um, work the same way as normal judges. However, it's not one judge. It's a panel of three, or in some cases, they call it en banc, um, but basically it's all of the different judges um, that preside in District 4. Normally, they rotate off into this panel of three. There's a total of, let's say, um, you know, nine or 10, um, and then a panel of three will hear, hear your case. Uh, en banc, in certain instances where all nine to 10 justices meet and rule together at once, um, it would work similarly to the uh, Supreme Court that way. So if you finally um, get to this appeal process, um, and really any, any part along the way, um, they have to be held to what's called the standard of stare decisis or um, prior precedent is another name for it. Um, and something you have to understand is that they have to rule based not only on the Constitution, but in previous court rulings based on their similar situation. So, uh, for instance, um, the Supreme Court has ruled, um, as we saw uh, previously, uh, that, uh, you know, the freedom of speech is limited during times of war, right? That's a, an acceptable limitation. So where the government can take away certain aspects of free speech during times of war, that sets a precedent or sometimes called stare decisis to future cases where if it comes up again, both the U.S. Court of Appeals and the district courts, if a similar case were to arise, they would have to rule the same way because with vertical stare decisis, all right, as in going from the Supreme Court down through the Court of Appeals and district courts are binding, um, meaning that they have to rule the same way that uh, SCOTUS did. All right. Now, if um, let's say um, the uh, South Carolina's district court all right, had a case and they ruled in favor um, of, um, of the plaintiff and then in the North Carolina District Court, they had a very similar case and they ruled the opposite way. Then um, if that were to happen um, again at the Court of Appeals or say like a, you know, an appeals court in one district versus another district were to um, have uh, similar cases, but different rulings, oftentimes uh, that would go and get settled by the Supreme Court. The reason why is because they can have different rulings, all right, from South Carolina's district court to North Carolina's district court, that's called horizontal stare decisis. And basically that just means that it's persuasive, right? They may rule based the way South Carolina did, but they don't have to. Um, and so uh, it is not set in stone that they are going to have to follow um, bind. There's no binding precedent that says uh, that court or you know, South Carolina's court has to follow what the North Carolina court did. 
all right, or the district four has to follow what district five did. It only works vertically, as in the Supreme Court can tell um, the lower courts how to rule. All right, so again, vertical is binding. So what the Supreme Court rules, the lower courts of appeal and the district courts have to rule uh, similarly in similar cases. Um, but if it were from the U.S. Court of Appeals and the fourth district court versus the fifth district court, it's just persuasive because it's horizontal. And so they don't have to follow what each other do. They could rule separately and let the Supreme Court handle it. OK, um, same way for the district courts. If it's vertical, then it's binding. If it's horizontal, it's persuasive. OK. All right. And so quick reminder on how to get to the Supreme Court. Um, remember, they have both original and appellate jurisdiction, meaning they can uh, hear the case for the first time in, in certain instances, such as a state versus another state or the state versus the federal government. But they, most of their cases are appellate, as in they've been uh, ruled on by a lower court and they've been uh, you know, waiting to hear that again at the Supreme Court level. Um, they uh, have pretty much complete control over their docket or what cases they hear. However, this uh, Congress uh, can um, require them to hear a certain case. Um, but that, again, hasn't happened since like 1988. It's very rare. Um, the writ of certiorari is what you have to file in order to be granted um, a, your case before the Supreme Court. And they get put in what they call the cert pool of about 8,000 different cases each year. Um, and then Basically, they, uh, the Supreme Court Justices Conference and uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice sets the discuss list or narrows it down to the top 10, 15 percent. And then four of the nine justices have to agree in order to take up a case. OK, it's called the rule of four. And only about one percent of the 8000 cases make it to the Supreme Court. Now, if you are one of the lucky ones. Uh, and your case goes before the Supreme Court, the first thing you have to do is submit a written merit brief, or basically it's your argument that you would submit to the Supreme Court. Um, it's going to be very long, exhaustive, and basically explaining why your side is right. So based on this amendment and this reasoning, you should come to this holding, etc. It's going to be like the written version of their argument. Um, additionally, um, Anybody, as you know, can submit an amicus curiae brief or a friend of the court brief helping to persuade the justices to join one side or the other. Oftentimes this is done by interest groups um, or other similar groups to help sway the case. Um, and this would be like uh, someone trying to explain or add to the argument on uh, one side's behalf. Um, then they go through the oral argument structure that we've talked about before. Uh, but basically, they have 30 minutes per side and it, there's no witnesses. They just give the oral version of that same written argument they had before. Um, this oral argument um, is oftentimes interrupted by the Supreme Court justices and uh, in many ways is um, pretty rude, kind of interrupting, asking questions by the Supreme Court justices. And a lot of times they just start talking amongst themselves and don't and, and cut off the lawyer that's speaking um, at that time. The main reason why is because they're trying to, um, in many ways, convince one another to join their side and try to be convincing. So they'll try to make points and um, help establish which side they believe is most correct. Finally, after that is um, the oral arguments are over, they um, take an initial vote and conference and have discussion. Um, but remember, the final vote on like nine to nothing, seven to uh, to uh, five to four, that final vote is fluid, as in it can change until the majority opinions are released to the public. Um, so that opinion oftentimes gets um, sent out um, or assigned to um, a different member by the chief justice or the highest ranking uh, member or the longest serving member in uh, the majority side. Um, so there's a majority opinion uh, that gets put out. They also have what's called a concurring opinion, uh, which means that you, um, you know, you agree, but for different reasons. Um, and there's also a dissenting opinion, which basically is the rationale for why they ruled in the minority side. But the main one you need to pay attention to is the majority opinion. Um, these are the ones that the case briefs are based on. But this is the legal reasoning why the Supreme Court came to the side that they did. 
this sets a precedent to explain um, why they would rule that way in the future. This oftentimes create what we call test. So if it were to arise again, um, future courts would know how to decide it. This is what we call, like, for instance, the clear and present danger test. If speech were to create a clear and present danger, then it can be restricted, such as in the Schenck case where he passed out pamphlets to um, encourage people to avoid the war during, you know, the draft during World War One. So this would create a clear and present danger, and therefore it's a test for the future cases that if they were to fail that test, then uh, they would, uh, you know, be able to be restricted. All right. Um, and so this is instituted, uh, like who writes the majority opinion by a myriad of factors, but mainly to make sure that um, people on the majority side stay on the majority side. So they're going to assign it to a member who, um, in theory at least, um, would help keep people on that side, not be too polarizing one way or the other. All right, so here are nine justices again. So, uh, you know, remember these guys have to um, agree, and when they write those majority opinions, how to make sure that everyone on their side still agrees. So if you have a uh, member who, um, you know, after you write the opinion, doesn't agree with it anymore, they can join the other side. All right, finally, what prevents you from getting to the Supreme Court? All right, besides all the things that we talked about before, um, here are some things that are barriers from you getting to the Supreme Court. Um, so number one is cost. Uh, believe it or not, it costs a lot of money, not only for lawyers, but for legal fees, um, as in um, court fees. Every time you have a court case, you are uh, basically having to pay a fee in order to make sure that the, the court can run properly. So in addition to your tax money, you also have to pay fees per use. Um, this would off, oftentimes go to the budget for, um, you know, keeping the lights on, paying the staffers and um, you know, the court stenographer, the bailiff, etc. They would all be paid through court fees. So if you cannot afford these, oftentimes that prevents you from getting to the Supreme Court. Now, some things that you can do in order to get around this is sometimes that if you are truly poor and uh, unable to pay this, um, you can file an informa pauperis, um, basically, uh, you know, status um, claim to the courts. This would allow you to basically um, say that I, I truly can't afford it and there's no way that I could reach the court um, without it. And these would be granted on a case by case basis, right? It's basically like the equivalent of like free and reduced lunch, but for, um, you know, the court system. Oftentimes, too, interest groups, if they uh, would like to see your case be brought up um, before the court, they will oftentimes help pay your legal fees. Um, additionally, things that keep you from getting to uh, the Supreme Court, number one, or excuse me, number two, is your standing. You have to be the one that's actually in the suit before you can sue. All right, what I mean by that is if we take that Schink versus the United States example, not anybody could sue the United States for the law, uh, you know, the Espionage Act that said that you couldn't, um, you know, basically uh, provoke any kind of unrest within the country through your speech. Um, not anybody could sue the federal government for that. You had to have broken the law and be charged with that crime to be able to sue the government by saying that's unconstitutional. So I, myself, who did not break that law, could not then go and sue based on that. So that's what I mean by standing. You have to be the person in that. So to give you a modern day example, um, there was a recent case that came out about Wells Fargo and they have this class action lawsuit um, where if you were pressured into creating and opening a new bank account, um, basically for no real reason at all, but to, to open an additional bank account, that is as in you already had an account there to open another one by an agent at Wells Fargo. Um, this was done um, to basically artificially raise their stock prices. Um, and try to like falsify documents and um, prove to investors that their business was doing better than it was. Um, but in actuality, they were just having more accounts opened by the same people. Um, so they were sued for fraud, basically. And anybody who was forced to, um, or not forced to, but persuaded to um, open up a new account for no real reason um, could file in this class action but you can only file in this class action if you were one of the people that were affected by it. 
all right, because those people have standing. Uh, so in that this case, I was one of those people. Um, and so I got an email on the mail or excuse me, an email basically stating that I um, qualify for this class action. And if I would like to join it, then I have to send all this documentation in and basically say that I would like to be included and possibly get um, some money back in, in the future. Um, so anyway, you have to be the person in standing to be able to go to the court. Not anybody can sue the court. Also, it has to deal with just disability. Is this a case that the court can settle? Now, if oftentimes if the Constitution is silent on it or if it's more of a political question, um, then it cannot um, be settled by the court. Uh, we saw this um, previously in the Baker v. Carr um, um, court case that we talked about earlier in the year. But basically, um, it's one where you have to decide, is the does the Constitution right, answer the question? Can the Supreme Court answer the question based on the Constitution or is the Constitution silent? If the Constitution is silent, then it's not a justiciable question. As in, like, this is why they oftentimes say gerrymandering is still legal because it doesn't say anything about it. Now, if we were to pass an amendment to the Constitution that talks about gerrymandering, then we could uh, then have the court ruling on it. But right now, they're pretty much staying silent because it's not justiciable. It's a political question instead. And finally, um, they have to have jurisdiction. If it is a state issue or a state law, then unless it violates the Constitution, they don't have the jurisdiction to deal with it, as in the Supreme Court does not. They only deal with federal laws or state laws that violate the Constitution. Um, the only time that there are exceptions, uh, as you can see here, um, is uh, when the uh, exceptions clause in Section 2, where uh, Congress can require uh, them to take up a case. All right. Um, otherwise, they would follow normal um, you know, procedures in order to um, decide whether or not they have the correct jurisdiction. Um, so dealing with federal law or state laws that deal with constitutional questions is when they have jurisdiction, either original or appellate. All right, that should be it. Um, let me know, obviously, um, if we have any questions, there's be some opportunities for you guys to ask, but make sure that you understand exactly, uh, you know, not only how you get to the Supreme Court, but what prevents you from getting